All right. Someone asks, do you have suggestions that may help with healing and or reaching the quantum field? Clearing negative entities, that's a really important piece because when we're in a negative state, we draw to us negative entities, non-physical beings that help maintain that state and can implant negative thoughts into our mind, into the voice in our head, so that the voice in our head becomes exceptionally negative. So learning how you can clear the negativity and raise your vibration and become more positive is a very important part of healing. And there are also healers who are able to help clear those negative entities with you. But ultimately, you will have to address the issue, the wounding of, from your childhood, most likely, that made it possible for negative entities to resonate with your negativity and come close to you. So when we're wounded as children, we're vulnerable to fear. We tend to lack trust, and that creates a negative environment that allows the voice in our head when it's negative to really stick. We really believe it. So we need to learn to inquire into those negative thoughts and see that they're not true and maybe have to work with a therapist or a healer or energy worker or an intuitive who can help heal that, that wounding that creates those that negative thoughts. A lot of the healing is about whatever you can do to move into a more positive state, including reframing your beliefs or using positive affirmations, but also just really getting at the core of what you deeply believe about yourself that is not true. Children come to negative conclusions about themselves because they don't know any better. If the parents are unhappy, they automatically assume that it's their fault. And so, so many of us, even in rather mildly negative upbringings, can be quite wounded by being around parents who are wounded or very unhappy. So just uncovering that and seeing what the root of our negativity is, and then doing various um, inner child work, forgiveness, reframing, affirmations, and also clearing of negative energy. That kind of touches on a few of the things that we've talked about in the various books so far. One thing I would add, of course, and most of you aren't here are aware that we every week we have a free healing and prayer circle gathering. And one thing that can be really helpful is just to step back and realize that what you truly are cannot be harmed that what you are is always already fully healed, fully healthy, fully complete. And fully here. And fully here. I, I sometimes say the deepest healing is when you uh, realize that there's really truly nothing that needs to be healed. And again, that sounds like a contradiction to what Gina said. We still function and operate on this very, you know, human level with a, with a physical body, that needs to do the kind of work that she talked about or that needs to address our health in all kinds of, in all kinds of ways, diet, exercise, the whole gamut. And what you truly are is always already fine. So it's just nice every now and then to take a step back, kind of catch your breath from the, you know, from the, the, the work of being human, the work of being alive, the work of trying to heal things. And just remember that it's all, it's all good. Yeah. And the reason for healing things is it makes it easier for you to drop into the place that is your divine self, your true state, your natural state. Yeah, that's kind of how they're complementary. Mm -hmm. but, it, but your natural state is always here. That's a very, yeah. very good point. <laughs> yeah. um, someone says, please talk about healing our wounds from our past lives. Past life regression is great. When it's done properly, you're able to witness or view that event from your soul's perspective, mm. from your higher self's perspective, if you will, from the true biggest perspective. Mm. So whatever conclusion you came to as a result of that trauma in a past life, it was an incorrect conclusion. All of our wounds 
are based on incorrect conclusions we've come to as children or as a result of trauma. And when you do a past life regression, the therapist hopefully will help you see that from your adult self or from your higher self or from the bigger perspective that knows that all is well and that ultimately you are never harmed and that you are well and whole and loved. All of that is what heals. Love is what heals. The higher reframed perspective is what heals. It's not going back and re-experiencing that as you experienced it. No, you're not supposed to do that in a past life regression. You're not supposed to get involved with it and re-traumatize yourself. <laughs> the purpose is to re-experience it from a place of distance, wisdom, loving kindness and compassion with that self that went through that. Yeah, it's a flexibility. Like I said earlier about the, the biggest truth of healing is that there's nothing here that needs to be healed. But that's not really the whole story because as Gina is saying, stepping out of the experience and viewing it from a higher perspective, from even just, you know, viewing it from outside the experience, it allows you to access all kinds of different qualities, resources, abilities of your, of your consciousness. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's important to be able to step back in to your human experience. Sometimes people think the purpose of the spiritual path is to get as far out of the human experience <laughs> as possible into some hugely expanded bliss state and get stuck there. I would never argue against hugely expanded bliss states, but <laughs> to me, the ultimate, the ideal is this flexibility where you can experience that dimension of your being and you can be very embodied in your humanness, very functional, very effective in your life. And what allows both of those is this kind of flexibility, this willingness to shift in and out. And past life regression is actually a form of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone asks if it's necessary for enlightenment to dig into past lives, to forgive our past lives characters. Mm -hmm. Some teachers say that, but I think it's a promotion of their Akashic Records reading. Yeah, that could be. Um. <laughs> well, it depends on if you've got woundings from that past life that are interfering with your being able to drop into presence in this lifetime. Yeah. If you are healed enough that you can be present a good part of your day, that's good. I mean, we could do healing work forever, but you don't need to. You just need to clear the deepest negativity, the deepest wounds. Whatever keeps you going back to your voice in your head and believing it, whatever keeps you tied to that voice. See, the more negative that voice is, the more difficult it is for us to detach from it. The more negative it is, the more that points to some kind of wounding or healing that is needed. So if you don't have a very negative voice in your head and you are able to be present in your life, then you're pretty well healed. Good enough. <laughs> you know, nobody gets healed 100%. But, but it's a matter of how much time can you spend being present and in a place of peace and love and acceptance and kindness. If you can't be in that place, except for brief moments, then there must be some healing that you need to do. And where to look is in your most negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. To examine those and see if they're true. Of course, you'll find that they're not true. Mm -hmm. Your negative thoughts are not true. But you need to examine, write them down, write down the stuff that's in the voice in your head, the stuff you say to yourself all the time the fears that you have, and take a good look at what's in the voice in your head, and then ask, is, is it true? And see that it is never the whole truth. It's some very small perspective, conclusion you came to when you were very young and didn't know any better, and when you didn't understand that life is benevolent, and that we're all here to learn, that there's a good, positive way to look at our experiences. Um, I often use the metaphor that if you're in a room and it's really stuffy and there, you, you need some fresh air, 
you don't actually have to go around and knock down all four walls in order to get some fresh air. If you can just open one window, then the room fills with fresh air. And so you can take that same kind of perspective to this uh, challenge of healing. If you, if you can get the, the feeling of what it's like to have compassion and to heal and to open up and to create, you know, some open windows in your being, that's, that's enough to experience the deeper truths of your being. Um, you don't have to clear out every single potential difficult experience throughout all your lifetimes. It would take you as many more lifetimes <laughs> as it took you to get them. And by then you'd have new ones to work on. Well, I also want to mention that, that we never get, totally get rid of the voice in our head. When after awakening and very far along beyond awakening towards enlightenment, you will still have a voice in your head but it will not seem like it's your voice. In other words, you won't be identified with it. It'll seem like a bad radio station in the background, something that you don't listen to, something that doesn't have a, any kind of influence over you that you don't give voice to. So that's the progress. It's not that the voice in the head ever is going to go away. It's still going to you know, yammer on in the background, but it's in the background and you no longer give it any weight because you've seen through it. You've seen that that isn't who you are, that it's just a bunch of programmed thoughts that you've had over and over and over again, and that you'll continue to have over and over again a lot of the same ones, although many do subside after awakening. But don't expect that the voice in your head will ever go away. Nobody's walking around with a totally silent mind. I experienced that for five days after I awakened, but then the voice in the head came back, but it was never again like it used to be. It's not my voice. I don't see it as me. It's like uh, someone else's voice. It's like you have this entity that is just talking away, and you happen to hear it inside your own mind, but it, it just doesn't matter what it's saying, yes. because you don't believe it. It's more like a... Because liars just don't deserve your attention. It's more like a TV or radio playing in the attic. Once you know it's a liar, it just can't fool you anymore. Once you've seen Beyond a Magic Trick, it can't fool you anymore. It's just like, there it is again, there it goes again, and you just turn away and continue to pay attention to the here and now, to what you're doing to whatever's coming out of the flow, to whatever internal, very subtle senses of intuition, urges, drives are coming to you from the divine self. Because that is the alternative to being moved by the, the voice in your head, is that you are then moved by a deeper force that doesn't speak to you in words, but is just silent and it pressures you, it drives you to move towards certain activities and away from others. You all know what I'm talking about because that's how most of you live most of the time. Really, most of you are being guided intuitively in your life to go towards certain occupations, certain activities. Your divine self is pushing you with excitement and joy and a yes to do certain things and to not do other things. That is what you live by after awakening and after you are spending more time in presence. That's the alternative to the voice in your head telling you what to do every moment and pressuring you like a slave driver to do this, do that, do it faster. You're not doing it good enough. Divine self pushes you, inspires you, gives you excitement, joy. And, I, you know, this is kind of paradoxical, but it's also your divine self that gives you the sense of contraction, the suffering that you experience in life, that is the feedback mechanism. It has mm -hmm. to also be able to tell you uh, when you're going possibly in the wrong direction or you're focusing on something that's just not very true or important or relevant or meaningful. It's kind of like the child of game where you say you're getting warmer or you're getting colder. In order to have that game work, in order to get good guidance, from the person you're playing with, they have to tell you when you're getting colder. Of course, they also have to tell you when you're getting warmer. And so your divine self, yes, it gives you these impulses, these drives, these inspirations, and it also contracts you 
when something is not as true, not as effective, not as meaningful, not as important. And so you can trust that also. I always say if something's not very true, if it's not having that feeling of expansiveness and openness and aliveness, then you know you can stop and say, okay, well, what else is true here? <laughs>